think we're going to finish up our discussion on subtleties and nuances on the change grid. Um, and I thought it could be an interesting thing for us to play with, um, building on what we talked about on yesterday's um, Oracle of the Self training call. So uh, one of the things we were uh, really focused on yesterday was the role of dysfunction in um, you know, the change process, how it comes into play, how prevalent it is, et cetera. And one of the little ahas that I think we, we all kind of had uh, was that when you are inside of the green circle, this is where functionality really ends up living. And if you're outside of the, green, of the red circle, then we know that's where dysfunctionality reigns supreme. So it's in between this green circle and the red circle that if I call it normal expressions of dysfunction are likely to be encountered. And again, we define dysfunction as not operating at optimum e efficiency. So humans don't always make the right choices, um, you know, every time and do they follow, they, they don't necessarily follow through on it. And so that's how the dysfunction tends to express itself. So there's some chaos and some confusion and some work that has to be sorted out. But we thought inside of the green circle, this is where you are able to live a functional kind of life where you're making the right decisions in the right way at the right time. And maybe if the, if the situation warrants it, you're going to move further out grid and get it done, or maybe you're going to move further down grid and get it more formalized or, you know, I don't know, depending what it is, maybe you're a little up grid, maybe you're a little uh, in grid, but uh, yeah, that's what we were thinking about. So I thought, you know, we've, we did have a layer of the change grid, um, or rather a reference tool in the change grid. We were talking about radial trends on the change grid. I don't know if you guys remember that, but we were talking about where someone's most logical, where they're going to be more emotionally ruled, where they're going to be more um, focused on themselves versus others versus information. And so there is a layer that we could pull out to get even more uh, subtleties and nuances about what's going on on the change grid. Um, okay, anyway, just wanted to make a connection between what we talked about yesterday and um, this discussion about subtleties and nuances. Uh, before we uh, continue our little exploration, do you guys have any questions, comments, thoughts you want to share about this subtlety, nuance kind of a thing? I'm looking forward to it. I missed um, last Thursday's and yeah, it would be great. Oh. Yeah, we were just, uh, last Thursday, I think I threw out a scenario, uh, honestly, off the top of my head, I don't remember what the scenario was, but one way or another, we were going like, well, now what happens if we move up just a little bit or down a little bit? And it was very interesting to see um, how things actually do change, even as you just move one little step in um, whatever direction you want to move on from where you were. And we were saying that sometimes when you're at the intersection of things, you're on a line or an intersection of lines, then there's a lot more that needs to be said because there's a blending of things that happens when you get to these intersection points, like where I am right now, coordinates nine and six. Well, look what's happening at nine and six. Let me see if I can zoom in on this. Nine and six. Well, if I look at the four main quadrants, I'm on the border between outgrid and downgrid. Well, right there, what might being on the border of outgrid and downgrid tell us on the border of driver and analytical? So not yeah. ready. Yeah. So say that again, not ready. Not ready. No, nope. tell us more. Well, they're still thinking about it. They're they're obviously on the border of taking action. But I, I think they're concerned they don't have enough data. Mm, okay, interesting. All right. And they're also, if you look at it, they're also on the border between the lowest part of power and I guess I'll call it the highest point of power apathy there as well. And then if you look at the orange lines, they're at the intersection of the amiable driver, the analytical driver, the driven analytical and the expressive analytical. I mean, do you guys get the, my, my whole point here? Do you, so like, there's a lot you could say about that, that and these intersections add a uh, need to talk about blending of things or transitions between uh, two other, you know, name and described labeled sorts of areas on it. Yeah. yeah and see, since yeah. their ability is greater than a challenge, they could just be stuck. 
Well, um, that's a good point to make. And so, you know, if they're at nine and six, they have one and a half times the ability um, that the situated hand requires. So nine is one and a half times the size of six. And so there is this idea that the puzzle has been solved, that this can now become more of a um, routine sort of thing or more of a formalized. Again, you, again, this is about subtleties and nuances. So do you guys pick up on the vibe that as I move further down grid, things get a little bit more settled? but they're not subtle like they are deep down in apathy. They're just starting to like take their shape and the shape is a little bit more reliable. And so maybe it's time to start saying like, this is our way. Uh, I'm thinking about it in an organizational setting. How do you actually come up with procedures? If you're developing a, pr a procedure manual, well, you don't just create a new procedure and write it out. You go like, well, we got to work with this procedure. Is it, have we played with it long enough that it actually has reliability, that it, it's as efficient as we can make it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, at a certain point, you're going to get here on the whole subject. What do you guys think about that? What do you think happens? Yeah. You know, T, this, this brings it's up something like interesting for me as well, because if somebody, is, if somebody is plotting here, Yep. but they're not getting the work done. Right. The question is if this is the right place. Well, you know, it can be the right place for the activity to be best performed, but you are absolutely right. What's the guarantee that the person is actually going to follow through and do it? So why don't you guys rattle off for me some of the things that could interfere with someone at this place actually getting that task done? Authority, permission, ADHD. Yep. Resources. Yep. They may not have the resources. They may not have the authority. They may have difficulty it. focusing on something. What else is going on? Underestimated the task. They might have underestimated the task or, or overestimated their ability to meet the task. Yeah. And so is it front uh, the front of the stove or is it moving towards the back of the stove? Toward, well, toward the front. Right now, it's still at the kind of front thing because we still have that power energy. We still have enough driver energy going on that they're still trying to get something done. But if they don't hop on this now, where do you think they're going to be a month from now? Down. Yeah. And so they're going to go like, well, you know, we haven't come up with, uh, we, you know, we didn't develop the, the procedure um, at that time. And now we haven't got around to, there's a lot of other stuff going on, which is the other distractor. There's other stuff. It's not like you've only got one thing on your change grid. And so um, I guess what I'm saying is that should it surprise us that uh, procedure manuals are never really done and they're never really updated. <laughs> You know? I, I, I was about to say earlier, T, that this is a this is a great place for a technical writer. It is a great place for a technical writer, um, as long as we can get them to focus on it there. Because if they move further downgrade about it, what happens to the, you know, the execution of the, I mean, right here? Think about that. This is engagement. Right here, this is the engagement ring. I'm not even in engagement anymore. I'm now in down grid, uh, midway down grid intention, right? That's what this line or this whole band right here is. That's intention. So that technical writer has very strong intentions to get it done. And there's still enough productive tension to have it on the front of their stove. Um, and there's still enough driver energy that there is this, um, you know, nonstop thought about getting it all done. And so this is a great time to get it done. But what happens if they are distracted by other things going on in the change grid? Because again, people pay attention where they find their tension, anything that's further up grid. Is actually, yeah, actually, I was just thinking too that it's not just the technical writer, but the sponsor of the process. Oh, okay. They have full accountability versus a technical writer. And, um, but so much, uh, many other things, what I've known about sponsors is that, you know, well, the technical writer's doing it all. I, I can go on yeah. to other things. Yep, and they delegate. Therefore, mm -hmm. the technical writer a lot of time goes down. Right. In fact, uh, now you, that we've introduced this thought about a dynamic, more individuals in play. If uh, this technical writer, that's a perfectly good example, because again, you know, this part of the change grid is where strong documentation can occur. 
this is where things get formalized and uh, lots of good stuff happens there, but it has to be done. It has to be formalized. The, the procedure has to be written. And so if this individual has got someone further upgrid about the same subject, because mm -hmm. maybe that sponsor is getting pressured from whoever uh, uh, in, in the organization that says, we need to get this all done once and for all, we need you to make sure it gets done. Well, maybe that energy of this individual who's further upgrid will compel them to put more pressure on this individual to keep them upgraded. You know, they're just putting in place upgrade maneuvers. So, uh, and if anything, it's just going to be the fourth upgrade maneuver about accountability. So uh, keep them a track or whatever. But um, as uh, T just described, what happens if the sponsor kind of went like, well, there, there was a technical writer taking care of it now where <laughs> what's keeping this technical writer's energy high enough to get it done yeah yeah maybe nothing in which case what's good and again you know i don't think that i'm that i'm misrepresenting you when i say that i truly believe that the majority of companies have made some effort towards writing policies and procedures and all that and i don't know that anyone has actually ever finished the whole set that they might have uh, uh, they could have benefited from or whatever and even when they have it when's the last time they updated the thing you know, do you guys remember the days of three ring binders, like whole racks of three ring binders? And this yeah. was the, the policy and procedure manuals. Yes. I mean, just the and every no, month no, no. you might get a pile of punched uh, uh, three whole pages that you're supposed to take the time to update your binders. OK, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. right. I'm just saying yeah, that, 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 in a real that, world. That, that, that changed a bit with the uh, with uh, what is it ISO 9000, 9001. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And and now now that stuff is is much, much more because uh, I, I used to do those things. So ah. yeah, that's, well, and technical if was, writing is close to me. <laughs> yeah, and if there was ever something that benefited from being automated, it was that because it's far easier to update one electronic file available for access, uh, you know, on the internet than try to get a hundred different sets or more of binders uh, brought up to date. You know, so uh, there's a lot going on. But bottom line, it has to be done. And this is a great place for the person to do the job. Why am I saying this is a great place for an individual to do technical writing? And, you know, I don't have to stay right there. This general vicinity. Why is this a great area for something like technical writing? Because they are not, they're, they're doing it for one thing. They want to get it done, but they have to work through others. Mm -hmm. So there's a drive there and there has to be some analytical there and some relationships there. Yeah. Yep. 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 And so as well as creative. Yeah. Well, truly, 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 truly. And so let's see where that all is going to where that all can come from in this particular spot to really understand what this centered experience feels like. Let's look at the coordinates all the way around it and see if we can describe what's going on. So this individual would be a, a an expressive, driven, analytical, right? So primarily analytical, outgrid on the side of things, they're driven, but they're on the upgrid side of things. So there is a strong expressive element, which gets to Daniel's point about having some creativity going on. So I've got that a strong analytical energy, still the drive to get it done, and I'm trying to do it in a way that's creative, et cetera. Now, if I just come in grid a little bit, now I'm a driver primary energy, this spot here, um, but I'm an analytical driver, and technically, third energy, I'm an amiable driven driver. So this idea about working through other people and including others, this is also going on here. I come to this spot and now I am an amiable driver, but an analytical amiable driver. So again, the, the, I, my amiability is stronger than my focus on the an, an analysis, but I'm still driving at home. And then over here, now I'm really the interesting one. I'm a, I am a driven, expressive, analytical. 
a driven, expressive, analytical. For a moment, just bask in that and say, all right, what on earth? Someone is primarily an analytical, um, but they're really an expressive analytical. If you guys remember, we said that uh, true artistic creativity is pretty much here on the change grid. That's that expressive analytical energy. Um, so we know that regardless of what the art form is, the people who are best at that art form understand that there are um, techniques involved, there are specific practices, there are proven ways to be using materials, etc. So the world's best painters aren't someone who just slaps paint on there. There's method to their madness. There's an, an analytical, a strong appreciation for what the art form actually um, is about and what the materials capabilities are and all that sort of appreciation going on there. And, and obviously writing a symphony, it's gonna be the same kind of a thing. So an expressive analytical is great when it comes to developing uh, something, uh, you know, of an artistic kind of creative sort of a nature. Now add a driver tertiary energy and then double it because again, you're, you're here on the grid. So, um, you know, you got to add more right here. I am the driven, expressive, analytical. Well, technically I'm going to be a driven, driven, expressive, analytical or I'm an analytical, analytical, amiable driver, you know? <laughs> so just making stuff up. Do you guys get the energy? So you blend all that together. What do you think uh, the result would be if we could get someone to actually focus on um, being, being do, doing that task? You might be <laughs> approaching a deadline. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just saying it's kind of like we still have to or, make sure it gets done. So this yeah. is, I forget who brought it up. Was it Brian? Uh, Brian, did you bring up who, who said you can be in an absolutely great place to get something done, but that doesn't guarantee you're going to do it. So what's missing? What's the other element we have to factor in here? Hmm. Maybe importance. Well, importance could certainly be it because that's going to move it to the top of my change cube. So if it's important enough, then sooner or later, I'm going to get around to doing it um, because that importance is being reinforced, um, you know, likelihood by other people around me saying we really need to get this done, you know, um, et cetera. But the other thing is, about, where's the thresholds? What, what threshold are we, are we needing here to get a job done? Threshold of activation. It's, isn't it strange that I actually need to know, is my threshold of activation down here? I mean, usually we think of the threshold of activation as being heartline or north and the threshold of delegation, heartline or south. And um, I can kind of feel energetically that this person might go, oh, do I really have to do this? Don't we have someone else who can do this? I mean, I'm, I'm getting to be uh, on the brink of power apathy where I know I want to delegate things. So... Uh, <laughs> But not necessarily. I mean, if that person, if they are in their sweet spot of yep. um, of creativity, which on an analytical level, you mm -hmm. know, and then that that's where the activation is. That's where it makes sense. So it's uh, I don't necessarily see them unless there's something that's getting in their way of moving further down grid. Right. And so if this is something that is sufficiently high, remember that your change grid doesn't have one activity on it. So there's a constant competition going on between activities on your change grid. And so if this individual has got a bunch of other stuff that's further up grid, well, then we're going to have a tension, a tension problem. You know, they don't have enough tension to pay attention to this one front and center. That's what people want to do. But if someone would help them clear up this clutter or reassign all those things to allow this person the environment and the opportunity to focus on it. Um, I, I'm certainly not a technical writer, but I can tell you that um, while I think I, I do a good job of writing, I know that I've got to go into the mode and then stay in the mode. If you pull me out of that mode, what's the chances of me getting back into it? You know what I mean? It's like I find it easy to write when I'm in this right mind spot. But if I'm not in that mind spot, it's really you know, it's really tough and I don't know that the quality of the writing is quite what I would want it to be. Um, all right, so, so let's, again, we're looking at nuances. So as I look at this, I go, well, there's a certain benefit to this particular location. 
But now let's move ourselves into management mode and say, well, they are in a great location for it. Um, lots of stuff going in their favor, but they're just not really getting it done. Therefore, I need to manage their tension. So what would you do? How, what, which, which uh, approach, which maneuver, what would you do to try to uh, impact that performance? I try to, to increase their tension by, by moving them, uh, helping them reprioritize so that they're moving further up grid. Okay. You know, move, either removing some, some, some other task that's getting in the way, but that is distracting them or, um, you know, yeah, just making them aware that there is a deadline and that something needs to happen. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Unfortunately, I can't move directly up grid. I'm either going to be moving up and in or up and out. So are you leaning towards move me up and out or up and in? I would have to say up and out if you're looking to to get to get get it out the door. Yep. 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 The manual that this person might be creating. Right, right, but, right. And, and again, yeah. now looking at subtleties and nuances, do you see that as I move from coordinates nine and six to coordinates nine and seven, just raising the perceived challenge by one little point, do you see that I'm no longer in intention? I'm actually engaged. Um, I actually am further away from power apathy. I actually am um, now ruled by a driver energy for my, my two contributors. Again, I'm not down here, so I don't have these, these analytical contributions, but I am an analytical driver, technically an amiable analytical driver, or I am a um, uh, an, uh, an analytical amiable driver. Yeah, an amiable analytical driver or an analytical amiable driver. That's where I am. So the driver energy is, is uh, that much more powerful. So again, we're doing this so that you can see that movement in even one point in the right direction can change things for you quite dramatically. Do you guys see that? Yeah? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, because no, like what happens, I would not move them up and in. Uh, not if the task is something like get up, get something written. Now, if it's a different task and it needs more of a people element, well, then, OK, I could build a case for that. But um, uh, the problem here is that I don't have sufficient tension and drive to get it done. Otherwise, I would have gotten it done. Right. We're not doing this if they're getting the work done. If they're getting the work done, please leave them alone. Uh, but if it's not happening, we need to move them further up and out to create to increase tension by technically you're only increasing tension by a half of a point. Um, but you're increasing um, oh, and you're only increasing drive by half of a point. Um, but it's all about this this increase in challenge by one full point. So to your question. Yep. So when we say move it by one point, are we okay. talking about the intensity of like Kathy mentioned, um, changing change the deadline. So if you're just moving at one point, is that like saying, all right, let the deadline is a week away versus if you wanted to move at two points, the deadline is in three days. You could do that or you could say, or oh, and or I need to see a first draft in 48 mm -hmm. hours. Okay. You know, so whatever it happens to be, but keep in mind what you've just done is an upgrade maneuver. So the upgrade maneuvers, again, are that we increase the standards against which we're measuring performance. And so the moment you tighten that deadline, you've increased the standards against which you're, you're gauging their performance. The other thing that I could do is change the task in some subtle or profound way. Off the top of my head, I'm sure I could come up with something, but not in this moment. But maybe I could change the task somehow. Um, I guess maybe I did if I said, no, let's not look at just getting the outcome done. Let's change the task and say we want to have a first draft, a second draft, and a final draft. You know, that, that could do that. Awaken the emotions. Um, 
well, I'm trying to awaken the emotions of pride. I'm trying to make them feel more on mission, on point or whatever. So I'm sure I could throw a little bit of we're counting on you or, you know, we know you're the right person for this. Let the, let's know, let us know what we can do to best support you in doing what you do best. I mean, I could definitely do some ego work there if I wanted to, but it really is also about boosting accountability, which seems to be the handiest of them so and that was just changing the changing the deadline so that um changed the task and it increased accountability so yeah um so chris was that uh, that uh yeah answer for you absolutely thank you yep 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 and again when i'm talking about a half a point uh for tension increase remember that when we're looking at our, our these diagonals it's always a discussion about challenge versus ability challenge versus ability creates this little diagonal pattern when i start looking at the at the horizontal and vertical um result vectors well then it's going to be of tension on the vertical and its drive on the horizontal. Well, to move from where I am at nine and six up to nine and seven, if you really think about it, I went up a half a point in tension and a half a point in drive. Or the right way to look at it is that by increasing perceived challenge by one point, I in effect um, created a half point increase in tension and in drive. Yeah, do you guys like subtleties and nuances? <laughs> I know I can't imagine yeah. ever explain this to a client. This really is for your no, your... but but oftentimes you get points on the grid that you know don't make sense, and you you have to find a way to move that that task or that objective to a healthier spot on the change grid. Yeah, yeah, you just do, and that's it again. With the question always being, is it getting done? If it's getting right. done, then the thresholds are in the right place. And uh, maybe just maybe my threshold of activation can be very low on certain activities. Like, where's your threshold of activation for falling asleep? You know, is that didn't even think there was that, but it's a it's an action I'm taking. It's something that I do. Well, my threshold of activation for falling asleep is obviously quite low. <laughs> My ability is very high. It's not all that difficult. I think I'll tell nap now. <laughs> so, so uh, you know. Now, staying staying asleep is a different story. Staying asleep is a very different story. Very different story. Yep, lots of things happen. All right. So again, subtleties and nuances on the change grid. Questions, comments, anyone else? Yeah. See, I was just thinking. So, um, <laughs> you know, if in that conversation there's a discovery that their perception of their ability is in fact not a nine and maybe, um, you know, it's an eight. Okay. So now we're, we're moving in a different direction yep. uh, <clears throat> versus staying on the plane of nine. Yep, 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 yep. And so now if we drop down to eight for ability, again, we're still looking at a technical writer, eight for ability, still six for challenge. You want to stay there? Yep. Yes. Well, they just moved in. They moved one band. Look at the intensity uh, bands. Yeah. They're less intense now. Okay, so again, we were looking at eight and six. So they are now uh, inside of fourth degree intensity. They were in fifth. We need them to be in sixth. And so uh, we've got an intensity issue that isn't uh, helping the situation. Um, if I look there a little bit further, what else is going on? Hmm. Um, well, they're solidly in power. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely in power, quite far away from the border. They're in the green circle. They're inside the green circle, so there's a certain peacefulness that comes from that. Ability is still greater than challenge. Ability is still greater than challenge, but not by the margin that we right. said, only like one and one and a quarter. Uh, thing to their to their ability and by the way we just have to acknowledge that if they think they're only an eight when it comes to writing something of a technical nature um you know what level of ability to write a particular technical document do you want someone to have to write that technical document um well tenure could be a factor in this as well you know so if it's someone who's fairly new in the job. One of the things we used to often ask uh, managers is, 
you know, what is, how long does it take one to become proficient in this particular area? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And so when you look at someone who has the least tenure on the team, uh, then yeah, the ability, reasonably so, could be lower than um, than more senior members of the team. That's right. And and we may very well say, if it's truly a technical kind of thing that needs to be written about, maybe we need to assign that to someone who has a higher perceived ability. I mean, their writing skills may be fine, but they may not have the technical knowledge base to write that particular technical document. So if it's just an assembly job, okay, well, then it could be just fine. But if they actually have to draft it and... Um, you know, validate it and all that stuff that comes along with good technical writing that might simply be too low. Uh, for and, that. and to go, if I may, T, to go yeah. along with that, you've also got, you know, technical writing is not like one thing, yeah. you know, and, and uh, in some organizations, it's here, go write about this. And in other organizations, you've got a, a complex set of requirements that you have to meet. And you have to interview and, and talk with subject matter experts, and they have to look at what you've done. And so there's there's an awful lot there that takes away from your ability to have control. Yep. Well, and so that just builds the case that it may very well be that this particular individual might not be ready yet to take the lead on that. They could be part of the writing team, but maybe they're not the lead on it. Well, in, in, a, in an organization, you could you could have that separation of six and eight and be the lead writer who knows the most stuff uh, simply because of the uh, uh, of the obstacles and the challenges with with dealing with uh, the people who are the true subject matter experts. Had had it happen. <laughs> yep, Very yep, painful. Well, exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, this also brings to mind. Um, Blanchard's development levels, right? When someone's at a D4 and regresses to being at a D3, right? Yeah. So it's perceived like confidence can be an issue. Uh, overwhelm could be an issue for them. Like when we went back from nine to eight, <laughs> yeah. it could just be a development issue too. Yeah, because again, if we were to overlay that readiness curve, okay, Um so just as a reminder to everyone, both Blanchard's model and Hersey's model use a curve to describe the leader behavior. So a style curve, um, what does Blanchard call it theirs? Is it still a style curve? That's a question for you, Chris. Yeah, pretty much. Still a style curve. But they use a, a linear uh, kind of progression for the for the readiness levels in the case of Hersey's and the developmental levels in the case of Blanchard. Um, but we created a overlay to the, to the style curve that is the readiness curve, and it maps to it perfectly so that we could put it on the master stream. So we know that if someone is going to be at that S4, or rather, is that going to be at a readiness level of four, they have to have a good degree of productive tension in and of themselves. They, they're, they're finding it within themselves, where at the readiness level of three, they still need an external infusion of some sort of um, input, feedback, whatever. That's why the style would be more of a participative style or what's it called in situational leadership to uh, coaching. Yes. Yeah, uh, more of a coaching kind. So there's still input coming from another person because the tension is lower uh, than we really need it to be. So that is definitely mapping to this. But generally, we would show Blanchard situational leadership uh, model uh, on the master stream as opposed to the change grid itself. Happy to go through that with you guys whenever you want to see that overlay again. Yeah, but good stuff. But you're absolutely right. They don't have enough tension here. So um, now what happens if we have someone who's overqualified for doing this particular task? So let's say their ability to do the technical writing is an 11 and uh, the challenge is a, um, uh, let's uh, go down to here. The challenge is, I guess I'm going to say 11 and in between three and four. I mean, do you see all these lines that are happening right here? 
uh, there's a lot of dynamics that are going and lots of things are changing. And because we don't stop at these, end, you know, we don't talk about having a challenge level of 3.25 and this one's 3.6 and, you know, we don't do that. So, so all this stuff could still be happening on, on there. So that individual that we're describing could very well be in a danger zone or on the border of a danger zone. They're outside of the red circle. Um, they are on the brink between the lowest of power apathy and whatever high part of, ap of apathy there might be. Uh, what else is going on with them? Um, an analytical- They're waiting on a deadline. Waiting on a deadline. And, but, yeah. Are they really waiting on the deadline? Maybe feeling disenfranchised disenfranchised yeah i mean look at their uh, level they're not even in intention anymore they're just down here in down grid awareness yeah they're just bored they're mm -hmm. bored by the task yeah. I'll, I'll tell you someone who who you all know of but you probably don't know him but the guy who invented the transistor at uh -huh. texas instruments when mm -hmm. i when i joined ti that's pretty much a description of where he was yeah he had done something fantastic when he was a younger man yep. and was still living on that yep. and was, was, uh, you know, just, uh, just kind of there as a, as a mentor and, yep. but had no, had no dynamic projects that, that, that were right. And so know, tremendously. And, and think about this now, think about that, that gentleman and the contribution that he ultimately made to life as we know it today. Um, but He's get, he's now down here in apathy or in the general vicinity there where we said people in apathy feel trapped in a velvet prison. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, things are very nice and cushy and comfortable. And no one's giving them any grief. And he's probably made plenty of money and he's, you know, well, well taken care of. All that stuff's going for him, but he feels underutilized. Um, yep. Remember, we said plotting downgrade represents a whole bunch of uns, untapped potential, unfulfilled missions, unrealized profits. You know, where's the growth down here? Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah. T, you're unmuted, Chris, Daniel. And uh, Brian, you're being particularly quiet today. So say something. Okay. I'm here. Oh, yay. Sorry. <laughs> No, I mean Brian hasn't said anything. Oh, yeah, Brian hasn't said anything. Yeah, no, no, no. You, you're, you, everyone's doing fine. I'm just going like, I'm not used to Brian being so quiet. So is he going? Nope, he's still muted. All right, we'll find out what's going on with him later. But my point is, is just, that just, just for contrast, T, I'm just, uh, I'm just in that little inter intercession there. I'm just drawn to say, now, what is the description on the opposite side? Over at, at uh, yeah, yes. Over here instead? Yes. Okay, yes. well, just compare and contrast. Well, now you look over here and you see this exact same. Um, well, actually, there is a couple of different lines here because you see how mm -hmm. there's a over here, you're most definitely in deep, deep apathy. So if I go over this point, your level of intensity has fallen even more. You're not even aware of what's going on. You're in. Um, well, you're hypo aware in the best case scenario, but technically you are in that space on the change grid before our look at awareness even begins. So pre-aware, you know, oblivious to what's going on. You're just kind of there going through the motions. There's no challenge whatsoever to be at that extreme. So again, realized. <coughs> Probably under-challenged, under-stimulated. Are you really getting the return that you would hope to be getting from somebody? Um, just not so much. Not so much. So, yeah, that's... Hanging out, hanging out, waiting to retire. Yeah, well, you know, that's basically it. And, um, yeah. But over here, this well, person... I think you said at one the, point, they've already retired. They just haven't left the building. Yeah, that's right, right, right. They've retired, mm -hmm, in, place. Mm -hmm. they've retired in place. And maybe that's just fine, depending on what the specific job is that they're doing. But going back to the guy who invented the transistor and they got saddled with that as, you know, his, um, I don't know, his defining moment of his career. On the one hand, you want to go like, I feel so flattered and somehow insulted at the same time. Right. <laughs> you know, because this, if you think about it right here, um, that coordinates 12 for ability, six for challenge. 
Right around here is where we find things like frustration, resentment, a feeling of being held back. But that's got a lot more of an active um, expression going on there. If you uh, felt that a while ago and still nothing changed, now you slip down a couple of more points and now you're where this guy is. So he's still probably frustrated, but he's grown accustomed to it. So he's just like throwing up both hands and say, you know, whatever, um, whatever the case may be, uh, you know, fine, fine, fine. I, I'm I'm the legend, but um, I could be doing other things, but nobody seems to want me to do that or whatever. So I don't even, I'm not even frustrated and resentful anymore. I've given up on that. And here I am down. Is anybody feeling sad for this guy? Anybody? I did. <laughs> I do, but yeah. I wonder if the coworkers say, "What do you have to complain about?" You know, Seems I I wish I was in your situation. Yeah, go right ahead, Chris. This this kind of rem I, I don't know when you were speaking. I kind of got a, the feeling for aging Americans, right? Because you're really good at this thing, and you're you're underappreciated, and people don't want to uh, like you don't you don't get those same opportunities anymore, right? So you're you're just kind of out there. Right, 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 right. And so think about how, I, I don't know in the world of actuarial science if it's changed all very much, but back when I was doing a lot of training for financial planners, um, one of the statistics that was accurate, at least at that time, was that the average life expectancy following your date of official retirement, when you actually retire, you guys remember what the life expectancy was post-retirement? It used to be two years for military. Yeah, two to three years. That's what you got. Two to three years. And so that's why they started saying like, well, we got to do something to get people to stay active, stay vibrant, you know, find another interest, do something else. Because the thought was that if you really want to live, you need a reason to live. And if you don't have a reason to live and you're just kind of going through the motions and one day feels very much like the next, you're going to end up slipping further and further and further down grid. Sounds and, like sounds like the uh, design of Sun City West. Well, that's what the whole that's why these active adult communities became so popular back in the 19. I guess they started in the 19 um, late 80s, maybe. I'm trying to think the actual date that Sun City itself was uh started it might have been in the late 60s i'd have to look it 60s, up yeah 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 it was a very yeah, big it was the sold out in, in one day it was it was there when i was out there in um the early 70s yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah, yeah. and then after sun city was built out he started building sun city west which is where we are but now if you look at similar communities, there's got to be, I'll bet I'd be surprised if there were a hundred such communities scattered around the country. They might not all be Del Webb communities, but there's still plenty of other uh, people who are building these active adult living kinds of things. Brian, you've unmuted. We're so glad. Hi there. Hi. Yeah, I was having a problem with my audio. I was talking, <laughs> but I can't, you know, naturally just go out to the uh, nearest store and buy headphones. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, right. Yeah, there's a little availability issue there. Well, we're we're just we're glad, we're glad, we're glad. Um, all right. So anyway, so this is a pretty sad place to be. And again, you know, looking at an aging population, you have to have a reason to live. And so maybe that's taking up a new hobby. Maybe that's about uh, getting involved in uh, volunteer or charity work. Maybe that's about starting a second little, uh, what do you call the businesses that are in your own home? Um, yeah, whatever. You know, home so, business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was saying, industry. <laughs> oh, well, there's a new name for it. I was going to say a side gig, but I think that's... A side hustle? What's that? Side hustle. A side hustle. Yeah, there you go. Maybe you're just coming up with a new hustle that you're trying to do. Like, uh, it's amazing. We've got one guy in our community. And again, this is a community of some 30 some odd thousand people, 35,000 people, if it's all full with the way that it is. So you got to believe among 35,000 people, every talent you could possibly want or need is somewhere to be found in this. Well, the guy I don't know what he did for a career, but his passion was fixing old clocks. 
And so now we know he's the go-to clock guy. So if you've got an old wind-up clock that's misbehaving, guess who wants to fix it? Or I'll give you another one. So lots of card games are played here. So people are very much into whether it's bridge or whatever game they happen to be playing. And so these little plastic uh, automatic card shufflers are very frequently found around here. And they cost, I don't know, 10, 12 bucks or whatever the case may be. We don't really understand how they work because it just seems like that they're alternating the cards. And so if you put the cards through a second time, didn't they just get put back the way they were to begin with? <laughs> and so it's, a, it's just it's a very weird uh, kind of a thing, but nevertheless, very, they're very popular. Well, because they're cheap plastic and they're, uh, you know, no one expects them to live very long. We know a guy whose passion in life is fixing those things. <laughs> And so it's like, great, great. You want to do that? You could do that. You could do that. Another thing that we actually need done, um, I might have mentioned it before, but uh, in Sun City Weston and many of the communities around here, our garbage cans are underground. And so if we have some garbage to throw out, we go outside and along the driveway, there's going to be a lid and you lift up this lid and you plop your bag inside. There's a there's a big uh, uh, galvanized steel pail thing, a big one that they can just yank out to dump the garbage. But our garbage is underground because of all the animals uh, that are around here. Well, those lids break occasionally. And I guess to replace that lid is a couple of hundred bucks, but we have a metal club and there are guys that spend their days re-welding those lids. So that, uh, you know, you can continue to use whatever it is. And they don't charge you much, if anything, to get this stuff done. So I'm bringing this up just to say that people look for something to give their life meaning. And it helps them on the social side of things because they're, you know, are meeting and interacting with other people. They're doing something purposeful so they can feel a sense of pride and accomplishment and that they are valued, talking about value-based uh, living and that. So that's a, that's something that we think is extremely important as someone, um, um, you know, gets older. Otherwise, when I think about people who- That's what I'm doing now. What's that? That's what I've done now, creating that uh, platform called the Playground Senior so Circle. Yeah, yeah, you and, got it. Uh, we're 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 trying to grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, everyone needs to know about it. I know Linda's checked it out, and she thinks it's absolutely great. Um, but we we kind of know this that one of the most dangerous things in an uh, in an aging population is loneliness. And uh, I would believe that that lack of involvement, lack of activity, that loneliness is going to have a negative impact on our neurochemistry. And if our neurochemistry isn't right, then how does that affect things like nutrient utilization? How does it affect things like, you know, ultimately stamina, balance, et cetera? And so I think that to not be involved is to end up moving even further and further down grid. Anyway, absolutely. that's just me. That's about that. Brian, thoughts about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's spot on. So we see that a lot. Uh, and I think even there's a big push now to reframe midlife and what that means. So, you know, this kind of uh, verbiage of anti-aging to pro-aging, you know, these kinds of things. There's actually, uh, for, for sitting, there's something called sitting disease that you can Google. Like there's actually 34 chronic conditions associated with that. With and just so, spending yeah, too much time sitting around? Just sitting too much. Like literally, you start sitting too much, like within a half hour, slowing down blood flow, mm -hmm. your muscles tighten. And so it creates these conditions for inflammation. And yeah. so we've seen this happen a lot in uh, older populations, to your point, like when they retire or a spouse pass or something like that, and they're you know, grieving a long period, like their health just declines rapidly. And yep. so if you notice all the longevity studies always talk about the support systems they have in place and these kinds of things, and that becomes important, not just yep. for the lifespan longevity, but the health span, that quality of life. No, you're absolutely right. We've we've personally experienced it. We had um, 
a relative whose uh, wife passed away and they were hopelessly devoted to one another. And we're convinced that he actually died of a broken heart, whatever the medical issue was that finally took his life. It is what it is. But we're telling you, he died from a broken heart. I wouldn't be surprised if Jimmy Carter goes within a month. Yeah, exactly. I don't even talking about about Jimmy Carter for just a second. I know he has been in hospice since right. what, the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, how, who among us knows? Is he alert enough to even know that Rosalind is gone? You know, we got a message yesterday. I don't know if it was through him or through, you know, publicists, but it was a heartfelt message in terms of their 76 year, I think, marriage. 70, yeah, 76 mm -hmm. years. Yeah, yeah. T, what were you about to say? I was just going to say, you never know when a person's going to be lucid, actually. Right. with um, Alzheimer's and so it could just hit him at the time saying she's not around and you know yeah great. See, I, had, again, I had great grandparents uh, great 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 grandparents that died within 13 hours of each other wow mm -hmm. yeah. that that's just amazing it's just amazing. and you know I have to say that if I was a caregiver for a Jimmy Carter right now I'd have to very um, carefully weigh what the benefit would be of giving him that piece of information uh -huh. you know uh, on the one hand you know does he have a right to know absolutely on the other hand is he going to know it and then forget that he knows it and have to relive the grief every time someone reminds him that she's not around anymore. Uh, I know when we took care of Linda's mom for so many years, she kept thinking that, you know, where's Johnny? Where's Johnny? Well, Johnny had preceded her in death by a decade. And so, but we would say, oh, he went to the store. He'll be back later. You know, I mean, you hate to lie to people, but you don't want to watch them go through the grieving of what do you mean he's not around anymore? You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, any of you who've tough. done who have done uh, that kind of uh, of uh, care, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, those mirror mirror neurons, as they call it, is a key significance in community. That's why communities like where you live become important because you get to uh, see other people in a different way and that becomes important. That was one of the tough issues for me in younger years, even, I might say, because you know, I'm only 54, but when my wife and daughter you know, when I lost him, that was a significant thing because I knew my wife since we were 12. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I have in Japanese culture, it's called a moai. Moai are close group circles. So there's five guys yep. that we've been in contact since I was 12. And we still keep contact with each other. And I knew my wife since I was 12. So, you know, these kinds of things, when you lose that kind of connection, has a significant impact on right. you. Right, absolutely and, right. And, and if I may, I, I I was taken from my birth family when I was four years old and reconnected with them quite serendipitously when I was 46. Hmm. And when that happened, the first experience that I had, not knowing that it was a family relation, was feeling an energy a good 30 feet away hmm. from this person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was later that I discovered that this was our hearts. Ah, oh, wow. it was my and 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 I'm a firm believer that when people have been together for so long that there's so much embedding that goes on in the in their energy between their hearts that when one passes, uh, the other knows it. Uh, yep, yep, yep. The stories know. are stories are 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 common. Of you know, I know someone is alive, or I know they're gone, or you know, at, at a distance. And distance has no meaning to it. As I yeah. put it in the chat, I know a couple that was in a hospital. The husband was in with one thing at one hospital, and the wife with another, and they both died within hours of each other, not knowing the other had passed. Yeah, right. You know, that's 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 very real. I mean, I've known, I've had that feeling. You know, so that's it's an amazing thing. It's incredible, and, yeah. and I, that's therefore I, I my feeling about Jimmy is 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 uh, bless his heart, and mm -hmm. and he already knows, but confirm him so there's no confusion. Yeah, yeah, there you are, there you are. Um, well, um, let's just talk a little bit about that for a second. I know we're at the top of the hour, but. I think on other calls, we've uh, acknowledged that human beings are really just um, 
a state of energy, a form that energy has taken. Um, if you look at us, I mean, we're made out of electrons. We are electricity. And we chemicals. Have energy form that just happened to, you know, end up in this particular shape. We're also not particularly well insulated. And so I've always thought there's no hocus pocus going on when we say that I can feel Linda's presence or I know what she's thinking because I know that everything that she's feeling is happening inside of electrical circuitry, you know, biochemical, mm -hmm. bioelectrical circuitry, and she's not very well insulated. Maybe, maybe she's constantly um, transmitting signals or we're all constantly transmitting signals. And if we've got someone else who's tuned in enough to us, because of that relationship, because of other connections, that they can really, uh, you know, receive our signals. And mm -hmm. uh, similarly, they can receive ours. I, I don't think there's anything mystical about that. I don't need that. I think the hard <laughs> math is to actually proven that because, you know, the, the hard, mm -hmm. we're, we're designed to actually process sensory data immediately. Mm -hmm. um, this is why they, uh, you know, you don't have to think when you touch a hot stove, you can respond to it, right? Right, right, right. Yep. We're designed to give sensory capacity the upper hand. And it's always was fascinating to me that if you look at the growth of a fetus, the heart forms first. You would think the brain does, mm. but the heart does because the brain needs, you know, the blood pumping for oh, oxygen. Yeah, it relies on the heart, yeah. So the heart forms first and in terms of fully developed yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then the brain, um, you know, once that process gets going. So it definitely feeds our uh, sensory capacity. And I think about, you know, how children can pick up on things and I'm, I'm highly sensitive people, person that picks up on different things in the environment. And so, you know, you think about uh, the predators that predicate on kids they try to rob them of them sensory capacity with distraction, right? Yeah. Like with candy or something that would draw them away, but they can feel it almost immediately. Like something isn't right with this person. Yep. So yep. it's amazing how we seem to undervalue that for its relevancy, that sensory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I body. think it, they, I think it gets undervalued because somewhere along the line, people decided that because you can't point to the organ that is picking up on that information, it's just got to be something that's in the mystical realm. I, yeah. I don't know where we pick up this information from, but I know we do. And I can certainly understand mechanically how it would happen. But I don't know what the receptor is. I like this idea about really it's your, the heart is the receptor of it. Mm, I don't know. Oh, I absolutely. Need to know. Yeah. <laughs> That's very real. I mean, as Brian says, I'm right with Brian on this. I mean, the studies have shown over and over again, your heart, your heart is your center. And then it feeds the, it feeds the brain um, as opposed to vice versa. But we've just been trained mostly in a lot of Western you know, civilization to go there. Um, um, you know, that notion of when reason came into play, you know, way, way back when. But, you know, my thought always is I always trust a kid's instinct about an individual or my animal's instinct about yep. an individual. Right. And if a cat or dog doesn't like somebody, then I know, I know to stay away from them. Uh, <laughs> Well, and, and speaking speaking of, about the heart and, and, and all of that, there's a, there's a wonderful book, The Heart's Code, I think is the name of it, but he talks about people who receive heart transplants, and I'm sure some of you know about this, that the, that the heart goes from one person, the donor, into the receiver, and the receiver comes out with attitudes, characteristics, et cetera, of the donor that they never had before. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. And see, these are different is... neurons and different systems, right? So when we're talking about sensory, those are afferent neurons. Then mm -hmm. that carries information from sensory receptors and skin and organs and things like that to the central nervous system. The efferent neurons carry motor information away from the nervous system. So these are two different processing systems. And so when we say incorporations like that kind of stuff that we're talking about, like what Kathy was teaching in somatic training, call it woo-woo, then you're not having a full body experience. And 
This yeah. is why so many people don't understand interpersonal skills in its totality because we're not understanding and not connected with ourselves. Well, uh, and, and I would agree with that and, and add to it that as long as we limit ourselves to uh, feeling, to chemistry, to physicality, yeah. and um, because the energy is the thing. Yeah, yeah, and there are fields because of because of the elements and so forth involved. There are there are fields, yeah. and those fields have an effect, and those fields are not limited to the uh, conduction time of a nerve. Right, 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 right. And they're not limited yeah. to the the uh, receptacle uh, of of a particular cell or or anything. Mm -hmm. Right, they're not the, it's right. not lock and key. It's frequencies. Yeah, it's a field. It pulses. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, one one other thing. I know we're we're going over time, but um, oh, we're not having a call on Thursday. Obviously, it's Thanksgiving, so people will be doing other things. But um, I've just always thought, like, when someone has an organ transplant, that would seem like that person now has within their body a very large sample of somebody else's DNA. So does the DNA inside of that transplanted organ never express itself? That's does a good it, question. Does it not get commingled? Does it does? I mean, it's right. I mean, DNA is in every cell in our entire being. Absolutely. And maybe that's why sometimes it's rejected and sometimes it isn't. That's a very interesting question. I don't, I don't know the answer. To yeah, that. I just don't know how the DNA could be contained in that organ in the long haul. Because right. there's going to be a shedding of cells and a replacement of cells. I mean, yeah. Here's a here's a potential for you to consider, and that is water. <laughs> yeah, well, water, H2O, is not what our body is composed of. Our body is composed of H3O2. That's why it doesn't slosh in the bottom of our feet, and we can actually move. Oh. Okay. Yes, that's, that's and, the topic and, for another session. I want to hear what H three O two is. Yeah, isn't that uh, heavy water? No. It it no, it's not heavy water. No, 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 no. H three O two is structured water. Right. It has structure, and therefore it can be programmed. And since the DNA is coming from one person into another pro person, and the the DNA in that sample is, as you say, small relative to the mass of DNA it's being added to, then it's going to con going to uh, um, merge or uh, meld or however you want to say that as a result. Yeah. Right? Okay. I just asked Chat GPT. It says H three O two typically refers to a loosely defined structure of water, often associated with the concept of poly water or structured water. Um, yeah, it's not the standard formula, but that's that's it. It's uh, completely acknowledged. It's water that stays in place regardless right. of gravity. That's why it's called living water. Like your muscles, ninety nine percent of that, mm -hmm. and so um, you, you know. I'm thinking it probably there's an expression just like when we're talking about genes, you can have a certain gene trait, like your family might have it, but something has to trigger it in a way to be a bad actor. So it's called gene expression. I'm thinking probably the same thing with the the yes. uh, 302 because the electrons and things that can pick up on stuff. And it will have to melt right if that makes sense. Like it's yeah. not just going to do it just because mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. everything has to have you know a kind of uh be alkaline as opposed to you know kind of creating a barrier like a magnet kind of a thing yep. yeah 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 interesting yeah, yeah we Is do it... need to talk about that <laughs> hey where does that lay on the stage for it for 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 uh for uh, um, uh, uh openness I, I use that stuff. I use um, I use I, I call them elixirs, but they're um, they're H three O two with embedded with frequencies and energies that uh, uh, are indicated by a scan that I do a bio a body field scan. Oh yeah, we definitely need to hear more about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but for now we're way over time, so uh, we'll go ahead and end for now. So. 
Thank you all very much for joining in today. Um, maybe that'll be our new topic next week. Uh, again, have a wonderful Thanksgiving and everybody. Yeah. Did, did you announce Thanksgiving is off earlier? Yeah, Thanksgiving is off. No call oh, up. Bummer. Heavy sigh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Day, happy everybody. Thanks, Bye, happy Thanksgiving. Everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> bless people. Bless people everywhere whose whose homes and properties are being taken by others. Exactly right. Give praise. Bye, everybody. Take care.